maybe we can start with sort of a backstory on um, how we connected, you know, what you do, um, and uh, yeah, just to, you know, take it from there. Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Simon New. I'm the CEO and co-founder of StormX. Uh, we've been building uh, a rewards app uh, featuring cryptocurrency since 2014. Uh, and yeah, we've been, you know, it's been an interesting journey. We've had a lot of ups and downs as a startup from, you know, two guys in a dorm room all the way to, you know, a massive global company. And then uh, definitely seeing a correction in the crypto scene and seeing, you know, like 80% of that, you know, falling down to reality. So uh, definitely went through a wild journey, but um, it's been a very global experience. Uh, met a lot of founders, uh, met a lot of uh, really smart people around the world because of what I do and got a lot of different perspective. Um, that's where I also met Alex. Um, he's also a great guy. Uh, met him through various conferences and I think he was working for a fund at the time and so we just connected and yeah we share some insights and I think the conversations that we have are extremely interesting um, and I think it's somewhat valuable for you know people to hear this and also get some you know perception and think maybe getting a different perspective on what's going on outside of you know your community yeah because i guess we were talking and we were sort of meeting each other um pretty consistently over i would say like a you know 69 month period sort of in and around that peak crypto boom of 2017 early 2018 and then we sort of lost you know lost touch for about two years and then the way uh, we kind of got things going again was um i think we just had this shared interest in markets and I think you posted up something on Facebook about your thoughts on where things were going um, with the markets in general. And uh, yeah, we just kicked things off from there and sort of rekindled this, um, this uh, the, you know, the shared interest in this relationship. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, I would be really interested in talking to you about is just again, with the markets, you know, where we are now, how we got here, uh, where we might be going. Um, you know, I think that for whatever reason, you know, the crypto and tech community was a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we can go into a little bit about why you thought that was the case and, um, you know, what people might be able to do going forward to stay on top of the relevant info and make, the, you know, the according um, financial decisions as a result. Yeah, definitely. I mean... For me, um, yeah, like I said, I mean, because uh, it's been such a cool company, I've had a lot of connections in China. And then, um, especially when it, start, it started blowing up in Wuhan, uh, and then, you know, you see these, like, videos from Twitter coming out about, like, hospitals being overrun and people dying out on the streets. And it, it seemed like fake video, right? So that, that part was a little bit hard to believe at that point because there is – you know, a bunch of fake news that's being spread across Twitter just for virality all the time. But then you read about, you know, the province of, you know, that, that Wuhan is under like 80 million people all of a sudden being locked down. And that's when you know that it's, you know, shit, it's serious, right? So yeah. even though China is saying that, I think they had like 10 or 20,000 cases, but, you know, the Chinese government, you can never really know what the true number is. But when they are willing to shut down an entire city and that's effectively going to cost them billions of dollars in losses, uh, you know, that that's something not to joke about, right? So in the U.S., we had zero cases. In Korea, I think it was one of the first countries to start, you know, uh, showing some cases and they were aggressive in testing and the numbers started getting really bad. And then I think in the U.S., we had one case where I live in Washington and then I started freaking out because when I started thinking about how bad our healthcare system is in the U.S. Uh, versus Korea and China, is effectively you can get you know free healthcare, right? Even if you're, uh, you know, doesn't matter if you're poor, or homeless, or just, it's effectively like you know universal healthcare over there. So when we come here and a bunch of middle class people and small business owners don't have really good healthcare, you know what's going to happen? Like people, and then. All of a sudden, like someone that got tested for Corona, which showed thirty-two hundred dollars to get tested, uh, and then this is becoming a problem, right? So, the U.S. Yeah, so it's like my parents were, you know, small business owners too. So, their mindset was never like, you know, whenever they're sick, it's not let's go to the hospital, which is 
pretty much everywhere across the world. But here it's just like, oh, I, I'm going to you know, suck it up and feel better. And that's the mentality of most small business owners here is because they can't afford it. You know, corporate employees, I think, have a little bit better options, but that isn't the case for a lot of the people. And then you start thinking, OK, our infrastructure is bad. What about all the retail employees that are working? You know, they're likely in the same situation, paycheck to paycheck. Things are going to get shut down. Like there's not going to be income levels. And then they're also going to start, you know, spreading, spreading across. And also people don't wear masks here, right? So uh, I think I posted something in like late February um, of like, oh, I'm, I'm afraid of when this starts hitting in the U.S. And that was when we hit yeah. 33 cases. Uh, and I wrote this long post on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. I think on Twitter it was like 10 threads or whatever, but I got a lot of heat from that. Uh, just because people were like, why, like, I, I, especially through direct messages, people were asking me like, why you're trying to scare people into thinking this is an apocalypse. This is like, this is just a flu. You know, this is like way less than the flu because, you know, flu kills people like 20,000 people uh, a year. And it's like, 33 people were just infected in a country like you're overblowing things and then now you know a little month and a half later i think things are completely different right we had already surpassed 20,000 people it only took 11 days to double from 1 million to 2 million while well, it took four months to get there and um just yeah i think the tech people especially they they were a little bit more aware of china being not this third world country that uh, this perspective of a lot of Americans think, and it's actually really advanced there. Uh, and then also, you know, taking data and analyzing how fast this actually can you know, spread. Right. So, you know, I, I think when you were talking about, you saw my post about markets, uh, for me, my immediate thought was, oh shit, this is going to kill a lot of businesses that are related to, uh, travel, like, you know, manufacturing companies and stuff like that. So I started yeah. showing the crap out of it in the January and then, um, yeah, I mean, it, it didn't take an effect right away. Um, I, I don't think it was until Tom Hanks and the NBA news hit. It was sometime, I think, in early February when that is when the market started really taking effect. So yeah. It was a big catalyst. Uh, and then so I was lucky enough to make uh, at the peak like 12x in returns um, just from like options in, in a short amount of time. And then, you know, for me, I still have uh, opinions on where this is going to go, but um, it, it has recovered quite a bit. And I have pulled out of my positions for short positions for like temporarily for a little bit, but I'm still in it now. Um, but it's extremely interesting. Um, yeah, with the Fed just, you know, printing unlimited amount of money, right? So they have pretty much said that, you know, we're not going to put a limit on this. And uh, first it was $6 trillion. And then now they just committed to about $2.3 trillion additionally. And we're seeing all these reports about real estate, uh, and then 32% uh, of Americans not making payments, and there's just a lot of tech layoffs, for example, all the retail stores, and, you know, Boeing, like Disney, like all these big companies, too, just laying off tons of people, so, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely not looking pretty. Yeah, yeah, I think your point about the importance of data and using empirical evidence to basically uh, extrapolate what might happen um, in the U.S., sort of around late February, early March, is super important because, you know, like you said, there's these perceptions of what China is and isn't. But um, you know, I think that if you take a look at all right, what happened there, there isn't any reason why you can't come to the conclusion that this could at least happen in the states and in other places in the world as well, too. Right. So, yeah, um, I, I I just thought that it was very. Um, interesting to see that massive divide between, I guess, people that are involved in tech, which is also quite a global community as well, too. Um, crypto, probably even more so. Um, and, uh, you know, that coupling with the fact that, yeah, I mean, people in these general industries tend to base or come to conclusions off of data, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, man, I mean, you know, to your point about um, being able to short the market, you know, for me, um, it's funny because I was also thinking that a lot of the people, especially in the West, um, were downplaying this. And, you know, while I maybe took some measures myself from a personal perspective to, I guess, address that risk, um, as well as, you know, from, from you know, like, like on my own personal account, I also sold um, a bunch of different cryptos and equities that I had, but I didn't go short, right? I didn't take that next step. Um, to actually think about, okay, if I do have this view, how do I then go express that view 
um, in a more uh, convicted way, if you will. So um, yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Like, like what, what, what was that sort of step that you took mentally? Um, if there was one, yeah. you know, I, I know that I was thinking similar things, but then I didn't take that step. Yeah. And, you know, looking back, obviously, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great point. I mean, I, I think most of, you know, people that were in tech have been anticipating a recession to hit for us, like, quite a bit, right? Because this is the long, longest bull market that we've had in history. Right. And Silicon Valley, right. a lot of the companies that were trying to go public, uh, they've been failing. SoftBank with WeWork, that was a complete disaster, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Uber IPO didn't do too hot. And a lot of these like IPOs that were hyped up weren't doing too great. Um, and so like even last year, a lot of the Silicon Valley companies have been trying to pressure their companies into exiting, right? To try to have a liquidity event and trying to pull their capital out. And you see, you know, like Jeff Bezos typically sells about $1 billion of his shares and that escalated to several billion dollars. Uh, and so, and then you saw Warren Buffett having a cash position of $150 billion there were a lot of signs that were pointing to this. Um, and then, you know, for me is like, I, so I've been preparing it since like last time. So when I, I, I did it by house, unfortunately, I think housing prices are going to go down. But um, one of the things that I was looking at when I was buy, buying a house was um, the one thing that's recession proof uh, is education. So when people start losing their jobs, they go back to school, try to get a better degree. And so I, I bought a house near uh, the university in Washington where, you know, worst comes to worst, I could have rental income, you know, by renting this out to people, right? And then there are also like zoning laws and stuff that change that favor. But um, just decisions that I had, like, so a lot of my assets are tied to a bullish market, like housing, you know, company equity, um, like stocks and all that stuff. And worst case scenario, let's say shit hits the fan. And then I, if I have shorts, you know, I, I was a little bit aggressive in buying options, but if I had shorts, it's a great hedge to, you know, with all the different, you know, positions that I have. And so if shit has this at the van, I might lose a ton of everything that I already own, uh, including a food truck business that I had, which is, you know, zero activity for the past three months. And that was generating good cash flow. And that, you know, you can't operate if there's a pandemic going on. Um, and it, you know, the, it combats the risk, right? And so hedging is, I, I think, one of the reasons why I press the gas on that. Um, but at the same time, yeah, but I, as you mentioned, when we saw people undermining the, like, how serious it could get here, I think that was just a, a signal for me. It was just like, well, people just, have, it's just the market hasn't priced in yet because people just don't realize it. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's the only way to beat it. But as of right now, I mean, it's, it's tough to, I, I tell anyone not to invest in the stock market when people are, you know, shorting or going long because all the economic science is saying that this is going to be worse than the Great Depression and going yeah. unemployment numbers and things like that. However, you know, Fed is also printing money at will. And so there's going to be a lot of, you know, ups and downs and it's going to be extremely intense. And it's right now sort of like putting money in a roulette, like, are you going to go red or black? Uh, and there's no clear answer. Uh, a lot of the easy short money has been gone because everything has been priced into a certain degree. Right. But at the same time, things are going to get worse. And so uh, I'm telling people to just hold cash. Like a lot, a lot of my friends that were in it just, you know, working, you know, uh, salary jobs are looking to buy back stocks because they thought it was really cheap. And, you know, I, I think that's extremely risky given that most companies might actually go bankrupt at this point, um, you know, get minus the bailout money. So it's it's tough to tell, right? Yeah. yeah. You touched on a great point there, which I want to sort of expand on, which is the concept of you know hedging yourself and just basically buying some insurance, right? I think that, you know, in the past couple of weeks, we've sort of seen how how human tendency is to, I think, downplay negative scenarios happening, right? And especially, you know, I'm guessing that you probably bought what S&P puts? Uh, actually, yeah, some of it. Um, I bought individual puts for uh, like Tesla, uh, Expedia, Square, like a lot of business. So I thought manufacturing companies in China, mm -hmm. uh, Tesla invested in a big portion of it. Um, that was probably going to be paused and their profits were probably going to be missed because they had a lot of um production issues already you know like xp like yeah. you know, hotels and, right. and things like that that's gonna go under and then 
um, yeah, various reasons, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's smart, actually. Yeah, I mean, Tesla obviously was going absolutely bananas crazy up until February. Right. Um, so that, yeah, that, that obviously makes a lot of sense. And, and, and congratulations to you for, for, for putting that trade on. Um, but yeah, you know, this concept of insurance, um, I just think that, you know, the like, risk always, especially towards the end of a bull market, tends to be really, really mispriced. And, you know, we, I'm sure a lot of people probably heard about how Bill Ackerman did what 100x on his $27 million with a CDS, right? And so when you have that kind of risk reward, um, you know, what's the downside, right? You know, you basically bought yourself probably less than a percentage worth of his total AUM, uh, assets under management, um, in the case that he's wrong. And in the case that he's right, you actually just save yourself from losing uh, mm -hmm. 30, 35% of your portfolio. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's, 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 a, that's another interesting point that I think is, is definitely worth talking about. And sort of to expand on that, sort of, uh, you know, I just uh, not really change the subject, but to, but to continue on to that point, you know, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I would love to also just share as well, too, just anecdotally, is how um, Hong Kong and some places in Asia have been dealing with this. And, I, and, and some of the things that I think um, get lost in terms of how the U.S. and the West is trying to extrapolate what, what, what has happened in Asia to, you know, their own situation, you know, uh, just speaking for myself, right. Uh, I've been in Hong Kong for the past two months, basically came here um, mid February uh, with the intention of actually going to the U S in early March. And then, um, you know, obviously at that point, this was mostly an Asia thing. Um, the virus was definitely epicenter China to a lesser degree, a couple of other countries, Hong Kong uh, being one of them, Singapore being another where, uh, vigilance was at a very, very um, high level. People were obviously scared. You know, they'd gone through the whole SARS experience 17 years ago now. Um, damn, it's a long time ago. <laughs> I was a senior in high school, so I remember that very clearly. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and, and then uh, as things, I guess, started to die down a little bit here and the number of confirmed cases went down, um, we started to obviously see case growth and infection growth in Italy and then um, in the U.S. And sort of at that time when the U.S. was really freaking out, um, I think it was, yeah, like right when the market started to really tank and it was when the NBA canceled the season or postponed it, Tom Hanks got it. Um, at that time, actually, in Singapore and Hong Kong um, and uh, Taiwan, um, people were starting to get a little bit complacent. You know, I remember people were – going to the gym again, uh, you saw a lot fewer masks being worn from a couple of weeks ago. And there was a couple of episodes where I would walk into a supermarket, my girlfriend and I, and you would see plenty of people actually not wearing masks. And for whatever reason, they were mostly foreigners um, or expats. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it was, it was just kind of shocking to see, and there was definitely a lot of complacency again, right? I think that there was a generally held understanding that, okay, we've sort of gotten over the hump. It's not here anymore. Uh, the worst is behind us. And then um, at that time, as the US and, and Europe was starting to get really bad, I think there was a lot of people that were coming from there to this part of the world, right, to escape. I think there was like a week um, when a lot of people on the West Coast were starting to go to Singapore and to Hong Kong, I saw somebody put out a tweet saying the new status symbol is yeah. um, piecing out of Silicon Valley and being able to I guess, camp out in Singapore, Hong Kong. Yeah. Right? And uh, yeah, it was at that time that actually a lot of cases started to spike up again um, in this part of the world. And I think there was a great New York Times article, I want to say Thursday or Friday last week, where they actually showed the difference um, and the delta between um, Singapore and Hong Kong and Taiwan cases, let's say before March 16th, 17th, around that time, and then after. And there's just this massive spike, right? And um, what's ironic too is that a lot of the people that were coming back from um, the US and Europe to Singapore and Hong Kong 
Um, they had actually originally fled Singapore and Hong Kong in January when things first started to pop off and they were coming back again, right? Mm. And then, so that complacency then led to the Hong Kong government stepping up a lot of measures. Um, what they did was they stopped all uh, tourist visits from um, actually being able to clear immigration. Uh, and so you, know, you could only come back to Hong Kong if you had a Hong Kong resident card. And then it was mandatory 14 day quarantine. And um, mm. they, they, I don't know if you heard about this, but they started giving people who, who arrived these wristbands. And these wristbands had um, like an RFID chip and it was connected to this app that you would download um, on your phone. And pretty much every three, um, every three or four hours, you had to check in um, mm. and basically punch in your location. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, there was, there was a bunch of people, mostly foreigners and expats, who snipped the band off and didn't listen yeah. and didn't follow. And then when that happened, you know, as they were tracing back on a, a, you know, a bunch of different cases, um, yeah. they, they found those people. And then you know, Carrie Lam, who's the chief executive of, of Hong Kong, made an announcement yeah. that, look, hey, not only uh, will we catch you if you do do this, but we're going to press charges and uh, prosecute you with a maximum fine of, I think, the equivalent of uh, 10,000 US dollars, maybe a little bit less, and then yeah. um, imprisonment up to six months. And so they really, yeah. really you know, up the ante. Singapore up the ante even further as they typically do. Yeah. Um, and they're in um, basically pretty much lockdown mode right now. Um, in Hong Kong, yeah. things are definitely a little bit more, uh, it, extreme they were i want to say three or four weeks ago but people can still walk around um you know like earlier today i went down to a public park um mm -hmm. just to go get some exercise and you know people social distance people all, all wear masks and it, it's funny most of most of the most of the people that were i guess in the um i'm a foreigner i'm not going to wear a mask camp a month ago you almost see nobody wearing well nobody not wearing a mask now right yeah. And I think yesterday Hong Kong announced that they had um, only four new cases, which is the lowest it's been in about three to four weeks, which is obviously a big plus. But, you know, again, right, like um, one of the things that I thought was an interesting comparison was how it's kind of tough to say, OK, this is what happened in China or this is what happened in Hong Kong and Singapore and Taiwan or Korea, which I want to get to. Um, and as a, and, and, and therefore, that's exactly what's going to happen in the U.S., right? I mean, number one, we know that China has way more tools at its disposal and way more ability to literally just lock an entire city down. Um, so that's yeah. one. Um, that's sort of like a government policy response, right? And the second thing, too, is just, I think, culturally and from more of a bottom-up individual perspective, um, a lot of these cultures, they've been through something similar, whether it was, you know, via SARS or uh, other, I guess you could say, milder epidemics in the past 10, 20 years. But then also, I think people have a general um, understanding that it, it, it's, it's more sensible to be a little bit risk averse, uh, whereas mm -hmm. I don't think that culturally you have the same thing happening in, you know, the U.S. and Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Super interesting because it's almost like a time travel machine, right? And stuff that's going on in Hong Kong and Taiwan, it, it's just we're just a few months behind in the U.S. And I mean, that's what scares me, right? So, I mean, right now, uh, yeah, we're, we have the Texas governor saying that they're trying to open up the borders this week. Uh, and then, you know, Trump is trying to expedite, you know, opening up the country again pretty soon. And then we have a lot of people in the U.S. thinking that they're just under house arrest. Uh, and then, you know, people aren't taking it as seriously still. Like, I think probably half the population is still isn't wearing masks because uh, who still hasn't acknowledged that masks were actually effective? They're now recommending that people wear masks. Uh, there's no masks available. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, surprising. But when, if we do, you know, release this lockdown too soon, we're just going to see a resurgence of cases coming back again sort of what happened to, you know, what you were describing in, you know, Singapore and Hong Kong and stuff. And then, you know, that's probably like in May for us. And then we're going to see more cases and the lockdown is going to be longer. And 
I know from a politician perspective, they probably have one of the hardest jobs right now because you're knowingly putting your country into a depression, not even a recession anymore, with yeah. like millions of people being unemployed. And if this goes on long enough, you're going to get into class warfare and you're going to get into people looting. And, you know, you know, there's a statistic on like every million people that are unemployed, like the percentage of suicides. And I can't remember exactly what that was, but, you know, people, you know, self-harming themselves. And also it's just crazy because right now we have this like crazy wealth gap just from this instance, because all the retail employees that need the paycheck are working in the front lines being possibly exposed to this on a daily basis while wealthy you know quote unquote employees are able to work from home and that is start you know that that's not going to be really you know it, it it's, it's going to cause a lot of uh commotion for sure and then if you look at some of the larger wars that have happened you know like communism and just even like the US and the English, just a lot of it was because of wealth, like wealth gap, right? And taxes and, you know, just how people view ideology and like few months longer and it'll get to that status. And like, that's what, you know, politicians definitely don't want that. They want people to be happy. And that's why they're putting all these money and trying to give everyone in this, um, to be in a good spot, but infrastructure is so bad. People can't get checks, you know, like their refund checks or stimulus checks for a long time. Like the Small Business Association Administration, uh, the process was you know, delayed for a few weeks because all the systems crashed. Um, and, you know, like Wells Fargo had to cap the limit because there were too many people applying for the loans. Um, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, but um, so out of the $349 billion that was um, reserved for the SBA fund, that a trillion dollars or more than a trillion dollars was requested on the first few days. And so there wasn't enough money for that. And so that means that government's also going to have to print more money as well too. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, but what does scare me is um, I, I do think that ultimately the politicians will be pressed to open up the borders too soon. And then people will go back to life as normal. And then another case of reinfections will happen because we've seen this happen in multiple countries and, like, unfortunately, you know, I don't think people learn um, unless it happens to their community. You know, it's just hard to see the outside perspective. Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, you and I, we both shared that uh, investment letter that Howard Marks from the Tree recently put out, which I think hit, hit, you know, hit, like, hit the nail on the head, right, in terms of this tight rope that, um, politicians um, and governments around the world are sort of walking right now, which is, um, I, I think he used the analogy of uh, the economy being a patient and governments right now inducing a coma, right? It's self-induced coma to fight this, to fight this virus, right? And the thinking is, okay, once the virus is over, then we can um, bring the patient back to life. But um, what I think a lot of people are missing and I think gets a little bit misconstrued in mainstream media. Um, and this is what Howard Marks was saying was that um, bring the patient life, bring the patient back to life. First of all, it probably isn't going to be as smooth as we think it is. Number one. And number two, it, it, it's too, um, it, it's a little bit too foolhardy maybe to think that um, as soon as you bring the patient back to life, i.e. open up the economy and, try and bring some semblance of normalcy back again, that things will just be smooth sailing, right? And so as a result, um, you know, it, it, it makes more sense to at least factor in some of the risks and some of the downside um, more than you might want to. You know, I think it's important also for us to just again remind everybody that, you know, obviously you and I, we both don't want to have a situation where the market drops another 30, 40, 50, 60%, who knows, and the economy gets bad because that means, you know, people get hurt, uh, people lose their jobs, people starve, people die. And, you know, I mean, for our, you know, for, from our perspective, we also are negatively affected as well too. But it's just, um, you know, to your point, right? Like, it's a really, really difficult position to be in right now. And um, yeah, from like an investment perspective, uh, you're obviously still very much net net long on the market overall, right? Via your holdings, via your house, etc. 
um, I am as well too via you know some of the holdings that I have. But um, yeah, it just makes sense to to, to to sort of manage the risks and to think about things from a risk adjusted perspective as opposed to just absolute returns, right? Because um, I think that's what gets lost. People always get focused on how much they can gain, but they don't factor in, okay, well, what's the downside or what's the trade-off that might happen if, if uh, the gains don't come or if uh, the bullish case that I want to or think will happen doesn't occur, right? And I think that's, that's really um, what, what, what sets apart you know, the great investors from everybody yeah. else, right? And I've definitely learned the hard way. I'm still learning, um, but it's really, really difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, think, I mean, the fact that you and I both have experience with crypto also has a lot of, you know, sort of perspective into how we think just because we've been burned so badly, right? Yeah, totally. um, then, yeah, I mean, yeah, Bitcoin fell from 20,000 to 3,200. And then the scary thing is like when bubbles crash and, you know, me personally losing millions of dollars too, and then learning this the hard way. Um, you know, and then I started looking into more of like how dot com bubble reacted and the Great Recession and, and even the Great Depression, right? Bubbles don't pop overnight. I mean, the, the scary thing was like the crash that we had, like it was like thirty percent in a few weeks, right? But that was scary, and people thought it was overly dramatic. But recessions fell for like nine hundred days, and then the Great Depression even longer. And so if, the, I mean, 2007 was 900 days of continuous falling. So there's, right. there's going to be like stock ups and downs, right? So when you factor that in, we're still really early on. And that's what's really scary is like, you know, what, what could happen is completely unknown. And especially with Bitcoin too, like how many times do we see a fake rally happening in like March or April just because like some big company announced that they're going to start integrating yeah. blockchain or something, right? Yeah. And so every time we have like fake rallies and then like, may there was like a consensus thing or consensus pump where people thought that there was gonna be a lot of like good news coming out of consensus in may so like i remember like people were partying and stuff like that they were spending yeah. like thousands of dollars in like new york and stuff and during that weekend and then it's like fell another like 10 percent, and it just kept yeah. falling until people got exhausted to the point that bitcoin went from yeah 20k to 3200 about a year right mm -hmm. i think it was about exactly about a year 2017 to 20 18, no, about two two years. Two was, years. Was the bottom? Yeah, the bottom was, was the bottom I would say December, January, twenty eighteen, going into early twenty nineteen. That was that was the bottom. Yeah. And um, yeah, so yeah, like you said, I mean, these things happened in. It's funny because you know markets, and this is the reason why at least I am so so enthralled and so interested in it, and I have been since I was seven years old, and was trading basketball cards was because so much of it has to do with human psychology, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you and I, we've both seen that chart, right, where there's a peak and then there's a sharp sell-off and drop-off and there's denial, yeah. right? And then I forget what the next steps are. There's fear, capitulation along down the way. And then you get to this point where people have lost hope, right? Um, and that's typically a good sign of the bottom. You know, we live through it with crypto. Yeah. Um, from 20, yeah. pretty much through the entire 2018 and into a little bit of 2019 as well too. And we're, we're not out of the woods yet, right? But um, that experience definitely was very, very helpful for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, again, to your point about people expecting things to be a V-shaped recovery, I mean, you know, hell, we could be wrong. Maybe, maybe it is a V-shaped recovery, but then that would be yeah. kind of a crazy, 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 crazy pump fake because we went through all yeah. that and what, you know, like that was it, right? I mean, we're pretty yeah. much at levels with the S&P uh, yeah. that were the same as a year ago, March, April, May, 2019, right? And so, yeah. again, right, like what, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I definitely just want to do my back of the envelope, zoom out, let's sort of just get some perspective analysis. I'm just like, after all that's happened, how is it that we're, at, or we're still at the same levels we were a year ago? Right, the world's a different place. Um, right. Yeah, that's that's the thing, right? So both sides, it's really hard to predict because at one hand, like the Fed, uh, there were rumors that they're going to start directly buying equities. Like that's the next step, uh, which you know that could trigger them to go up as well too, right? But then on the downside, it's just 
you know, there's not going to be stock buybacks anymore. You know, there's uh, people are going to start pulling into their pension funds because uh, they're going to get desperate. And then I think the U.S. government did announce that there's not going to be penalties for pay- pulling out, you know, uh, money from your retirement accounts. And then yeah. also, yeah. like, what was scary about the, yeah, when I started researching the last recession, what was scary was it only took a couple of these banks to start going under. Like when Lehman Brothers cr- collapsed, like that was a big trigger, and then everything started falling. And it only takes BlackRock to pull some money out, like a portion of their wealth to have this just complete domino to just start falling, right? So retail um, could be buying into this, and then a couple of these funds start exiting, and then it's just going to be a free fall. And that is what's really scary about this environment right now. So. Like if, yeah, I mean, I, if my friends own stocks, I'm not telling them to sell, like, but I've had friends that are saying that, oh, I'm going to rebuy because I think there's cheap. And I'm telling you, well, just hold on to cash because here's what's going to happen, right? Housing markets, like cars, like everything, like people are going to lose their money. So it's going to foreclosure. It's going to get repoed. Like there's going to be a lot of like really good assets that you can buy on sale for a huge discount in a few years. Just hold cash and save for a rainy day. And then if you do have enough cash until that point, then you can buy some really cheap, like hard assets. Like that's probably yeah. a better investment. Um, but if you're trying to pull into the stock market, like I can't tell you short, I can't tell you to go to long because I have no idea. Like both sides exactly. have a very valid argument. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's sure. totally. And, and, and I think another thing that's worth mentioning too, right? To expand on what you just said is what's the opportunity cost of being wrong? If you already mm-hmm. hold socks, okay, let's just say, um, things you end up being a V-shaped recovery. Well, you have exposure anyway. So it's like you're missing out, right? You, you already yeah. have that long exposure anyway. So yeah. it's not like the opportunity cost is, 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 okay, you don't have any exposure to those gains if they do happen, right? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, like you mentioned the last crisis in 2008, 2009. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I look back on that time a lot because I actually started off my career Pretty much around that time, I joined Goldman's structured product desk um, in the summer of 2007, so June 2007. And for any of you that watched Margin Call or The Big Short, I was on the exact desk at Goldman where all of those things were happening. Um, you know, all the CDOs, all the subprime mortgages, all of the CLOs, the collateralized loans, the asset box securities. Um, we even financed a a uh, pretty well-known TV show um, that was done off of a done off of a structured, um, you know, structured um, uh, a security, right? And so everything at that time under the sun was just being done with all of these structured products. And then you know you sort of saw, saw like the first cracks, um, and uh, it took a while, right? I mean, two thousand seven. At the end of 2007, there was a big sort of sharp fall off in August. We went back up. 2008, I actually ended up switching um, firms, and I went to another firm that was mostly focused on equities. And this is 2008, and I remember going to Tokyo in 2008, and in equities, like, nobody knew, I guess, the severity or the extent of what was going on in the fixed income markets, right? You know, here I was, 22. I was like, okay, you know, these people are smart people. Um, Obviously, they're going to know and uh, be a little bit more bearish and less optimistic than what I thought. And then when I, when I got there, I was just shocked by, by how many professional money managers, people that have been in this industry, um, in institutional finance for decades, um, didn't actually see, uh, see the bigger picture, right? And not that I was, you know, um, like the smartest guy, not that I saw the bigger picture either, but I just... It was just eye-opening to me, that contrast, right, from what I had been able to see in 2007, early 2008, and then in mid-2008, the summer 2008, just go into a completely different environment, but still, you know, institutional finance, bulge bracket investment plans, hedge funds, that kind of thing, but people looking at a whole different other asset class and them not having Mm -hmm. any clue, right? And then when Lehman happened, yeah, I mean, it's just basically a rush for the exits, right? And that's when things get really, really hairy. And that's when, you know, nobody wants to provide any liquidity. Nobody wants to bid for anything. And that's when prices just fall off a cliff. And it, you know, as you said, it was a bottoming process. It wasn't, it wasn't just one sharp drop all the way down. There was many instances where there were sharp rallies. People during those rallies, 
you know, had FOMO. And then it was only when I guess after several times of maybe people FOMOing in and thinking that there is hope that, yeah. um, uh, well, and then the market sort of going the other way, you know, that yeah. they started to lose that hope. Right. Um, okay basically getting punched in the face, right? Like you think, okay, this is the bottom. Yeah. You go in, you get smashed. A couple weeks later, another rally. Oh, this has to be the one. You get smashed again. And then it's after, you know, a process of this happening that you finally just give up hope. And that's actually probably just from a sentiment perspective, at least from what I've been able to see, um, that's actually when you might be near a bottom. Right, whether it's ahead yeah. or behind you, you don't know. Like nobody really knows what's going to be happening, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just important, I guess. Take these, take these anecdotes and um, these past experience, and at least try and apply them um, as best you can to the current situation. Um, yeah. But yeah, man. I mean, all this said, um, look, dude, how are you positioning yourself and 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 your company going forward? And um, you know, sort of uh, talk a little bit about some of the frameworks you might be thinking about going forward and how, you know, maybe the aftermath of COVID plays out in the real yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess we were fortunate in a way that we got to experience the crypto bubble bursting um, just as a company, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, it was very unfortunate. You know, we had a big staff and we had to do a big downsize and we sort of, experienced all the stuff that a lot of the tech companies are doing right now right where vc capital dries up and it's very interesting for a lot of the crypto companies that are still operating um you know not a lot of vcs were really looking forward to investing in this you know industry just because there was a bubble and then the interest all sort of dropped out and they're looking for the next big thing right and then um a lot of yeah i mean so we've been extremely frugal and our operating costs have been really low so we've been you know set up in a position where we had a few years of run rate for a while now and you know just keeping expenses low while we're trying to maintain revenue to be as high as possible right and our company is actually somewhat interesting because like we're a platform where we give people you know money when they try products and stuff and then also earn cash back so we've sort of seen an inverted relationship with covid um just like people are starting to uh, be a little bit more conscious on uh, like cashback stuff and like you know cash is becoming more important and then also a lot of people were staying home and on digital devices and there was a bit of a panic buying going on so we had stores like Target and Walmart where you can get cashback and you know that was a good selling point for us so mm -hmm. as a company like yeah we've been doing well and yeah fortunately we haven't had to do any downside uh, like layoffs or anything like that and I don't think we plan to for a while but uh, I'm definitely seeing that, you know, in the U.S., like every day there's another major company doing furloughs and layoffs. Um, it's, it's massive, right? I think Disney just like 40,000 people in Disney World yesterday. And then oh, wow. it was like that. Yelp. You know, it was like Yelp uh, before that, or like a few thousand people. Like in Seattle, too, there were a lot of big companies that were doing the same thing. And it's just the start too. like Boeing, you know, temporarily paused a lot of their manufacturing companies as well, too. And Tesla laid off a ton of people as well. And it's not just retail. A lot of people just think that it's just like restaurants and small businesses that are going to get impacted. It's a lot of tech companies, too, because like, the tech companies, the consumers, but they're, they're very dependent on consumer spending. And then then it trickles down into the SaaS and B2B companies because a lot of these tech companies that have more money from consumers, they can't spend money on the software. So now they're going to, first thing they're going to start doing, the same thing what we did was we cut on all unnecessary software that we didn't need. It's just like, what is monthly cost that we can start, you know, trimming as soon as possible. And then all of, this, all of a sudden these companies start making less revenue as well too. And then it keeps trickling down and then it just becomes this endless cycle. Um, and then, you know, ultimately it affects every industry like you know the real estate agents that are trying to sell houses too because not a lot of people have houses anymore like yeah the restaurant owners and like people that were you know, tailored toward a lot of these tech tech employees um you know like restaurants and stuff too that were selling 20 dollars avocado toast like even if they can come back and there's no avocado i mean there's yeah i mean that's the thing it's like you know i i you know it, you know but i i own a retail business as well here we want a food truck catering yeah. business and our profits came from 
primarily just tech employees doing catering businesses for all the big companies in Seattle because they were paying developers free meals like almost every day. And so there was an abundance of how much you can do it. But now with limited budgets, like all that's going to stop too. So even if the lockdown ends, um, a lot of these restaurants are still going to go under because their revenue is a lot lower. Um, They still have debts that they have to cover just because, you know, everything was shut down. It doesn't mean that their monthly bills weren't stacking up. There's insurance bills and phone bills and all these other things. And PPP loans cover some payroll and utilities and expenses, but it doesn't cover all fixed expenses, right? So a lot of these fixed rent costs too, um, that's like, you know, that might be deferred. They're all going to be due at a certain point. And then if you have six months or four months of rent payments, then that you have to do. And then when you come back, and all of a sudden you have half the revenue that you used to make, how are you going to pay that back? You're going to go in default. And that's it. So we are looking at something scary from an economy perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in Hong Kong and Asia as well, too, like we're seeing the same thing. I mean, as, as many people probably know, Hong Kong has probably had uh, the highest real estate prices in the world for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and just walking around, you know, again, you see, uh, restaurants not having any businesses, um, retail basically being completely quiet. There's nobody in stores. Um, and so as a result, you think, okay, an economy where so much is dependent on consumer spending, which then buttresses and supports the real estate market, especially the commercial real estate market. Um, like, <laughs> it's just hard to come to any kind of a, scenario whereby you think that um, spending rebounds and gets back to what it was or even close to where it was. And as a result, then, you know, obviously the next, I guess the next you know, logical conclusion to come to is that, well, hey, how, how are property prices going to be, be justified mm-hmm. for this? Right? Yeah. Um, certainly, um, I'm always trying to think about disconfirming evidence or things that go against my viewpoint to try and challenge whatever biases I might have. But it's really tough to, to, to actually come up with them right now, right? Because, um, you know, tourism, which uh, actually hopefully depends a lot on, not so much on, in the traditional sense of people coming here for holiday, but a lot of people from, especially mainland China, come down here to do shopping, to, uh, to, to, to take a quick, you know, one or two day trip um, on route to somewhere else. Uh, it's just easy for them to, you know, to access. That's all dried up. And so yeah. where's the incremental positive revenue or, 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 or incremental dollar going to come from? It's just, it's just really hard to imagine where it is, you know, where that comes from. And same with other parts of, um, parts of Asia, like Singapore, right? City states that are massively dependent on trade. Mm. Um, <laughs> Like, um, yeah, where does incremental dollar come from? Supply chains are all choked up. Uh, I thought, I, like, I actually thought it was it was only a U.S. thing. So I tried to order some stuff off of Amazon um, because they started started recently uh, servicing Hong Kong as well too. And the expected delivery date was May, like basically mid May, right? And I was like, well, there's no way I'm going to wait a month. So I said, F it, I'm going to try uh, Alibaba, AliExpress. Um, and I thought, okay, well, since, you know, the supply chain is literally just across the border, it should take that long. Even those are taking two weeks, right? And, and, and typically these things take 24 to 48 hours. And so that sort of shows you a little bit about some of the supply chain that might be happening. And also, you know, Hong Kong has a massive port and I wish I could show you the lighting isn't great, but I am basically staying in an apartment right now where I can see the container harbor, right? Mm-hmm. And um, there's just not that many ships going back and forth. I don't have the exact figures, but there's a visible decline in the number of container ships. And one of the interesting things that I've been sort of witnessing is um, there's a lot of what look like barges, uh, storage barges. So I don't know what that means, you know, whether it's maybe China trying to basically find ways to store oil, given oil's cheap prices mm-hmm. right now. I don't know. That, that, that's, that's just a conjecture. You know, who the hell knows? But yeah. it, there's a market visible decline in activity you know, that I can see in the yeah. heart, right? And so yeah. 
Um, yeah, I'd actually be really curious to know what's going on in Korea from what you've heard, what you've seen from your friends and family there. Yeah, I mean, I, you probably know this too. I mean, I flew out my parents to Korea and yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I think we had, yeah, again, I think it was, I bought them tickets when it was like 33 cases in the US and Korea it was like 8,000. So it was number two after China. Uh, but now it's completely reverse, right? US has more than 500,000 cases and Korea is still at 10,000. I think, yeah, I mean, people are just, you know, being really smart. Uh, everyone's wearing masks and a lot of social distancing. And, uh, you know, to what I'm hearing, there's still work being resumed. A lot of companies are doing remote, but I think there are a lot of retail businesses that were impacted negatively, unfortunately, because of that. But from my here, like I hear, I still hear like people going out and stuff and that's causing some concern um, yeah. because there might be risk of reinfection. And I think it was, there was recently, like a few weeks ago, uh, one, like one student, one college student that studied abroad was uh, in Jeju Island. Uh, and she went to all the hotels and all the like convenience stores and stuff, even though that she had symptoms. And then you know, it was like the city is trying to sue her uh, directly because like, it, it, like she had possibly just reinfected a ton of people. And I, I think she actually did. Wow. So it's absolutely crazy that it only takes one person to start this like wave back again, no matter how careful a country is. And so if you land in Korea, it's the same thing, right? So you have to uh, be under quarantine for 14 days. You have an app that tracks where you are. But yeah, a lot of the foreigners are the ones that are causing problems because they're not being as careful. Because um, uh, yeah, just unfortunately, I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, I'm in the U.S., but still there's a ton of people not taking it seriously enough or that still think that it's a flu. And then that's, that's going to be the problem as to why people start getting reinfected. And again, in Korea too, like when the outbreak started happening aggressively, it was because of one, uh, you know, female cultist member that started spreading it everywhere by going into all the hotels and all the restaurants and stuff. And then she was in the case number 30 something. And then that, that became like what it is right now. Um, so that's really scary, right? So you have a population of 320 million Americans and it only takes one person to do this. And then all of a sudden you, even if almost 99% of the population is being responsible, but you still have 10,000 people that are infecting it everywhere, then you know, you're doomed. So yeah, yeah. We'll see. I mean, the, I think the hope is, yeah, just social distance long enough. And then as much as it sucks to be under house arrest and the 14 day quarantine thing, like it's just the thing that needs to be done until vaccine has come out. Yeah, and I think a lot of us who live in relatively developed countries, it's not the end of the world. I mean, in terms of yeah, uh, it's a small price of pay, you know, pay, right? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. we're, not, we're not starving. There's a lot of people that have, you know, there are situations that are a lot worse than we are. So that's that's definitely one thing to keep in yeah. mind. Um, well, yeah, man. Look, uh, maybe maybe as a way to kind of finish off. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but, um, you know, I've been doing quite a bit of thinking about how uh, things change from a, maybe a more macro, even meta perspective going forward, um, consumer behavior, um, the way we just generally do things, whether it's from an individual perspective um, or, you know, a corporate level or even a governmental level. Um, talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how, how you're thinking in the, in the mid to long term on, on, on how, our world as we know it changes. Right, I, I, I think remote work is definitely gonna be the biggest impact, right? I mean, out of this, we're realizing that companies can still operate, you know, almost as efficiently as you were in an, op, you know, just in a traditional office, but you don't need a big office space. Uh, you don't need people wasting time on commutes. Um, and then you can also be, build a global, global company where you can hire staff anywhere, right? Uh, so I, I think that's going to be the biggest change, especially for us having to go through that downturn a few years ago. Yeah. Like that was one of the first things. We did. Like we cut the big office. Uh, a lot of you know U.S. people were unfortunately very expensive that we can afford as a startup. And so we started looking for talent elsewhere. Uh, a lot of our developers are from Eastern Europe right now. And then there's people you know just as hard work willing to work for half the pay just because living, living costs is a lot lower there. Um, and so I, I think we are going to see that shift. Unfortunately, U.S., we've seen the benefit of high salaries for too long. And so people that were making six-figure salaries in the U.S. 
it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to get that position now just because a lot of the companies are going to be short on cash. VC liquidity is definitely dried up. And so they're going to start looking for talent in Vietnam, um, like, you know, Thailand or like Europe, uh, just places that are cheaper. I know Vietnam is a very good emerging country where there's a lot of tech being, you know, like a lot of Asian countries have been looking for development there. Uh, I know India has been a hub in, for the U.S. for a long time too, but um, it's definitely going to be more of a global work, um, just operations going forward. Well, what about yourself? Like what are some of the trends that you think are going to happen? Definitely, I think um, remote work is a big one. And again, I think all I've got from the short commercial real estate makes so much sense, right? Um, so I definitely think that's one thing. Um, I've also been thinking quite a lot on kind of how this changes things from, let's just say, the, the relationship between, you know, I guess the trust contract that people inherently have between you know, the general population and the government, right? Um, mm -hmm. This has honestly been a pretty massive fuck up for lack of a better term um, for so yeah. many especially western countries and when you look yeah. at how uh honestly sure like what else can the government do at this point in the short term to try and alleviate this yeah i get why they're printing all this money i get why you know why they're doing a lot of things they're doing but you know when it comes to things like bailouts of these massive corporations especially i think about you know the airlines some of the cruise cruise um um, and some of the cruise lines, right, where um, something like up to 96% of free cash flow generated in the past 10 years was used for buybacks. Right? That kind of stuff yeah. just completely, I think, erodes so much trust between um, governments and the average person, right? And, um, you know, Ray Dalio, I think, three or four days ago, put out a great TED Talk that he did also via Zoom. It was a digital one where he talks about, um, you know, monetary systems and how they typically throughout in the past thousand plus years, uh, they've typically come in, you know, 50 to, 70, 50 to 70 year bands, right? You know, the U.S. has obviously had its system and that's been um, the one that the world basically follows, you know, USD is the reserve currency since the end of World War II, but how he now is deeply deeply questioning it and it was interesting to hear that how he's 60 40 pessimistic about where we're going right and so you know yeah i think about um to your you know to, to your question i think a lot about that whole slightly more macro meta um effect right that could happen in the long term or could happen sooner than we think um i think another thing too is just general habits in terms of um, companies in terms of individuals, right? And, and, and sort of thinking about cleanliness. I mean, coming from um, an Asian household, especially, you know, a Japanese one, I'm half Japanese, half Chinese, ethnically, you know, you put your, like, like when you come into the uh, house, right? When you go into anyone's home, you take your shoes off. Yeah. And, I mean, little things like that. Um, I think people are going to start thinking about more. It was funny, I was talking to some of my um, white friends uh, in the U.S. and you know they're talking about masks and everything. I was like, well, make sure you also take your shoes off when you enter the home. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> smart. I should do that, right? Just you know, little things like yeah. that. I think that that um, people in Asia and other parts of the world just sort of know as obvious. I think we'll start to have a pickup of that thinking, especially in the U.S. and Europe. Um, other forms that we take, right, is things like uh, contactless, whether it's payment or buttons, right? Anything where you mm -hmm. touch a button, um, I think, you know, that, 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 that will probably change. Um, you know, I know that when you go to pretty much any office building or lift uh, or, 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 or elevator lobby in any nice office building in um, Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, what have you, um, you know, they have disinfectant and hand sanitizer there. Right? Like when you go to someone's yeah. office and you go to their sort of front desk, like that waiting area, there's always hand yeah. sanitizer there, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think that little things like that will probably start to happen and, and, and we'll probably start to see more of in terms of just general behavior, um, you know, yeah. maybe providing even masks, like people provide tissues, right? Just there, you know, a box of masks. Um, I think we'll sort of start to see that too, you know, in Japan, 
for sure. And, I, and I'm pretty sure this happens in Korea as well too. Like if you have just even a mild cold, right? You wear a mask when you go to the office. Um, this thinking of, okay, it's not necessarily about me getting yeah. something. It's more about thinking about everybody else. I think that's yeah. a, that's a sort of change in people's thinking at the individual level that I think will also start happening as well too. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, like you said, there's just so many unknowns, uh, so many unknown unknowns as well too, that we'll just sort of have to see how things play out. But in the meantime, it makes sense to err on the side of caution, you know, be optimistic, yeah. but err on the side of caution because there's just so many things that we don't know about. And um, yeah, we've been on this, from a market's perspective, we've been on this, you know, what I like to call it a cocaine fueled um, high for over a decade now. And it's so tough to kind of wean yourself off of that, right? Um, human psychology doesn't just change at the snap of a finger, it takes time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, look, man, yo, thanks so much. It was, it was great doing this. I had so much fun talking to you about this. I would actually love to at some point, mm -hmm. maybe a couple months, uh, down the line, you know, kind of do this again and we can compare and contrast, um, some of the things that we talked about today with, with, uh, yeah. with then, um, and then, you know, maybe get into some, some more stuff. I mean, this, this yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure, man. It's, it's, it's really, really good just to pick this back up again. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah, you had a really funny, funny time, you know, like all, all the people that I met during that time, you know, I want to say mid 2017, to mid 2018, it was such a unique phase of both you know, our lives individually, but also just for the crypto blockchain industry as a whole. And I always look back on those times, the people that I met um, very fondly because, you know, yeah, sure. There was a bunch of shysters, a bunch of bad people that we probably got burned from, but um, mm -hmm. you know, just like the people like, that 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 were that were good and that were solid people um we always have that to kind of look back on and share right like there's not like basically if you weren't there you weren't there <laughs> you yeah. know so um yeah man it's, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure dude um and mm -hmm. yeah let's uh let's uh let's keep yeah. the comms channels open yeah for sure all right thanks all right, man. All right. much love okay. appreciate it dude signing off here